So first, let's start with, you know, we're still in time. Happy New Year to everyone. I hope that uh, you'll have a fantastic uh, 2024 year. And uh, for us, I think that that will be, uh, everything will be about consource or, or app to, uh, to um, handle consulting services. Uh, that's not the topic for today, but this is our baby. So we tend to be happy about it. Um, but today, this is a completely different topic. We're going to talk about delivery model and explain what it means. Uh, we'll explain why it's important, but also how to choose the right uh, delivery model. So uh, before we dive into that, can you guys confirm that you can hear me? <laughs> and, um, and that uh, the... This is, um, so I'm not like talking in to myself. Uh, can you do that in the chat? Uh, oh, I see, uh, is that you? Who, best for? I can. Okay, thank you. But you're the other speaker. Can, yeah, thank you, Ronald. <laughs> I appreciate. Um, okay, so. I think that let's get started. Um, I'll send you. You know, I had, I had, I hadn't uh, uploaded, uh, uploaded yes the uh, the slides in the in the handouts this time. So I'll take advantage of of um, of that to modify the slides and send back to all the attendees um, afterwards. I will also send you the uh, recording of that session after a roughly an hour, an hour and a half after um, the webinar is over. But, you know, with no further ado, let's get started. So just briefly before we dive in, some of you know us, but not all of you. I'm Hélène Lafitte. I'm the CEO of Consulting Quest. Uh, we're specialized in how to buy consulting services and how to implement the right um, processes and strategies to buy consulting. And Laurent is my CTO, uh, also working with me as an expert on how to buy consulting services, but mainly uh, developing the app that I've just mentioned before, Concerts. And um, and of course, he's my he's uh, my co-founder. Laurent, you wanted to add something about yourself, or do you think that's no, no, uh... that's fine. Thank, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so I I chose this. This uh, quote that is kind of be the, every every webinar I'm looking for a quote and uh, this one I thought was very interesting. It's from Nelson Mandela. May your choices reflect your hopes and not your fears. I think that um, in terms of what who to work with and how to work in consulting, it's it's really interesting to to look at the value you can get from a project, and that's what I put behind the words hope as opposed to what we traditionally do and, and kind of shrink ourselves to, to um, you know, the known. Um, there are many, many options that are available in terms of how to buy consulting services. And there are many options available in, in, in nuances, actually, in between the obvious options. And this is what we're going to talk about today. So if at, at any moment uh, during the webinar, if you... I uh, want to uh, ask a question. Don't hesitate. We'll, we'll do our best to answer the question as we go. Uh, and, and so there is on the side, on the left-hand side, there is a, a, um, a question um, icon. Just click there, ask your question, and we'll do our best to answer when you have them so you don't have to wait until the end of the, of the webinar to do that. Okay, so very quickly, um, what what we're going to discuss today, I touched about briefly, but let this is the agenda. We're going to explain to you what is what we mean by delivery model in consulting, what they are really. We give you examples. Then how what's the best way to approach them? How to build a framework for make or buy? And then we'll give you also some examples of how, on a practical standpoint, this can be implemented and then of course we leave some room to the question and answers but you know before we dive into that we have uh, a small 
a small pole um, just to get started, right? So this is just, you know, to get started about consulting and and uh, you know, a little bit of an icebreaker. What would be are which are of these which of these observations about working with consultants do you find most relatable? Don't hesitate, please. <laughs> it's only one choice, right? Yeah, there's unfortunately you have only one choice. Uh, you can't you can't have uh, everything. Yeah, I don't get any because I'm a I'm a co-host, so I cannot play. Yeah, you co-host absolutely. So, so, uh -huh. <laughs> I see. Yes. All right. I so I think that the the winner is um the that when consultant says strategic synergy. We often wonder if it's just a fancy way of saying teamwork. Um, <laughs> I think it comes from sometimes you have that feeling that they're using a lot of jargon or, you know, those keywords, the buzzwords. And um, I could have done a, a bingo. You know, we could have organized a bingo where we say synergy and, uh, and uh, you know, and, 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 and then we just, we just uh, try to do that. But joke aside i think that that's very interesting to to understand how consulting works in order to buy consulting and um and, and delivery model is is definitely part of that and to you know to give you a sense of what is it really so actually uh, i let you you know compliment what I, what i'm saying actually the, the delivery models is how the project is executed. And so you see immediately the connection between delivery model and make or buy, right? But it's not just that, meaning that, um, that that's also the everything uh, that you can see in between delivery model and, and uh, I mean, uh, internal and external, there are many, many options. And even when you look at working with external consultants, you all, you still have some different delivery model within, <laughs> within one category. So it's a bit more nuanced than that, but that's, that's the idea. And so make, I mean, we all understand that make is when you do, you produce in-house something, whether a good or a service, and buy is when you acquire it from an external vendor. That's then you know that's the uh, that's the definition. In terms of consulting, when you make it means that you are either launching a project with your own teams on top of their existing work, or with in-house consulting teams or certain excellence or you know whatever you call them internally. While well, buy is when you work with external resources, consulting firms, independent consultants, or anything equivalent to it. Okay. Mm -hmm. We have someone who wants to say something. Yes. I give access. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Leon. I just give access to Leon. Yeah. Well, if you want to say something, I give you access. Just jump in, okay? Uh, meanwhile, I will I will just comment on that uh, on that slide. Uh, at the end of the day, it's a it's a kind of a two step exercise. The first question is, do we want to do this project? And once you have decided that you want actually to do this project, how are you going to do this project? Are you going to do it with external resources, with internal resources, or a mix of both, or taking advantage of uh, other things? That have evolved in the in the consulting value chain, and that, that's what we will discuss in the in the coming minutes. Okay. Uh, just as I'm speaking, uh, take advantage to also uh, comment on the previous the poll, uh, strategic uh, strategic synergy. Um, yes. One thing I had been uh, I was leading the strategy for a chemical company uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, one of the the, the red flag was when someone was saying this acquisition, or this acquisition is strategic. It means that you don't know how to explain it. 
You cannot say what it's bringing to you. You cannot say what are the financial benefits. You just say it's strategic and it's always a red flag. It means that you're not really able to articulate why we really need to, to buy this company and how it will create value. So it's a, it's kind of the, the internal jargon because we were not okay. consultants. We're all internal, but a strategic acquisition, always be careful. Yeah, anyway, I think that's, uh, yeah, I think that's, uh, it's shared in, in every, in every company. And when you've worked with a very large company, and then you move on, you realize that many of the words that you thought were like real words or real acronyms that they are, in fact, very specific to your old company. Mm -hmm. So why is it important to select the, the, the right delivery model for, for your project? So because you could tell, OK, yeah, it's OK, but why is it so important? So the, the, the right delivery model, it's not. It's not, in, it's not internal, external. Uh, the, the way you choose it is based on many, many factors. And some of them are based on cost. So it can be because it's less expensive or it's more cost effective. It can be a matter of skills. You're looking for skills externally. Uh, it, it, you have also to consider the stakeholder engagement because there, there might be some resistance sometimes to work with external consultants for many reasons. Uh, um, then there's a matter of strategic alignment. Also, what is the market in terms of consulting? Is there outside the, 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 the niche expertise uh, that you're looking for? And all of this, you, you need to find like a balance between all of that. That's a compromise. And then this means that this is based on a given project. It's not something that you say at the beginning of the year, oh, this year we are going to do this delivery model, that doesn't work. It's really based on who you are, where you want to go on a given project. Who's the team that is leading that project? Do they have the tools? Do they need external tools? Blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. And that's how you can really um, choose the right model. And as you can see, the, the, the difficulty is that not only is it project-based, but also it is a key <laughs> success factor. Because if you don't choose the right delivery model, you could alienate you know, your stakeholders. That's a problem, even though everything else is, is right. Or you could uh, to work with external consultants and because the value that you, you have from that project is not super high, but you're working with premium consultants, then you know, you're know zeroing out the value by the it's price. Always, it's always a combination between impact and cost. And uh, some models will deliver more impact, some will not, but some will be much cheaper. And uh, it, it's always, at the end, it's a trade-off. Yes, exactly. Okay. Let's dive in. Yeah, so, so what are the different delivery models that we can find in consulting? So we'll find some, some um, you know, you, there's nothing. I'm not going to 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 bring you some groundbreaking news here, but this is what uh, we have. So first, it's internal team. So here, it's the it's the typical. You have a project, you launch it with your internal team. This is classic. They do that on top of their existing job. We know the pros and cons of that. The pros is that they know about the project and they know your company and they probably have the expertise. The cons is that there are two main uh, cons. The one is that uh, if it's on top of their existing work, it might be difficult to to allocate the, the sufficient time to this project to make it work. And the second is that, uh, especially on projects that are a bit uh, provocative or where there are some cost saving or, or you know difficult decision to make, it's really hard for internal employees to to push the boundaries and make it happen for many reasons. And because we we all want to survive in the company we work for. So uh, that and, and it's not necessarily conscious, but this is this is a con uh, for for internal teams, a con that you find also in the next uh, option, which is in house consulting. So here, we are a different model where in house consulting is usually a group that is independent that works exclusively on consulting project, even though they have only one client. So the main advantage is obviously that they know their client really inside out. Um, 
the downside mm -hmm. is that, yep. You can find several names. Sometimes it's not called internal consulting. Sometimes it's called excellence. Uh, sometimes it's called the process and methods. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are the teams that are usually working on internal projects, dedicated to internal projects or dedicated to improving uh, a given capability. Uh, they can be within a single group. They can be distributed across several functions. And last but not least, you can also have sometimes, uh, contradicting a little bit what you were saying, Ellen, uh, some uh, in-house consulting that, that becomes... Uh, that starts offering its services externally, such as Porsche Consulting, yes, for instance, uh, when they start developing very strong uh, expertise in manufacturing or these kind of things, they start offering their services outside. That, which, that's uh, true, but this is not the majority. And, yeah. and um, what, what, what is interesting with in-house consulting is indeed the depth of expertise in one given industry. Um, and that's where they can really... Uh, bring some some interesting views. The 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 downside is the lack of a cross pollination, uh, cross pollination, cross pollination. I don't remember. <laughs> well, you know what I mean. Like the fact that you can transpose some knowledge that you learn in one industry to the next. This is harder for them. So on projects that are a bit out of the box thinking, them that might be a bit difficult. But but that doesn't mean that working with internal consultants is not a good thing. There are some projects where they are absolutely relevant. And the good thing is that they're often less expensive than external consultants. So that also can be uh, an interesting point for, um, for, for the clients. A third, a third option is temporary workforce. So here the idea is that you are hiring temporary or contract staff for for when you have a surge in workload or when you want to add some expertise that is not available in house, it can be project based, sometimes it's not. But the idea is that you we're talking about here about individuals mostly, right? And uh, it's a classic. So you can do that with a consultant. You can do that without consultant. But this is also a delivery model that exists just when you have, especially when you have in search in or you have someone missing or someone uh, someone that's absent or someone like that. It's also uh, something that you see pop. There's also something you see popping up when there is a, a hiring freeze, and yeah. uh, there is not yet a consulting freeze. Sometimes they come in the opposite order. Uh, you will see some people staffing their teams with uh, with consultants, which uh, which might not be the most economical way, but it might be yes. the only way to, to to move forward. And then there's micro consulting. So micro, what we call micro consulting, is actually. Uh, independent consultant consulting marketplaces for very short mission very specialized and um this is also something but it's usually limited and it's usually one I mean um one consultant one project or one need it's not there's rarely teams that you're hiring through that through that system even though this is changing a little bit but the, it, it comes with some challenges to to handle people with different backgrounds that are not used to work together on a single project as consultants, this is this is this is a challenge. But this is something that is developing, and this is due to you know the value chain changing and and the, and the gig economy and so on. And finally, we have you know the traditional consulting firms that go from boutiques to the very very big names. Um, that we all know. So this is kind of, these are the different delivery models. This is one way of looking at that because actually it's a bit more complicated than that. And as I mentioned, even when you when you take the external consulting um, model, then even there you have several models. You have the study and recommend, then you have implementation consultants, you have consultants that um, do do it with you, some consultants that do it for you, some consultants that tell you what to do when you do it. <laughs> All of those delivery models coexist and it's really depending on who you are and and what you're looking for, what are your objectives, etc. Just as I mentioned before, that even when you choose to externalize and work with a consulting firm, there still are some you know, choices that you can make on how you want to work with it. So in, in the middle of this, uh, and on, on top of that, that's what I was mentioning, there is an embeddling in the consulting 
value chain. And um, and and so um, as as part of the activity of consulting firms, there before you would have all all of, all of this here that you have in that slide would be come together in one in one um, in one, one company. Consulting yeah. was yeah, the consulting was all of this. But now uh, things are evolving. And we see that there are some some uh, different services that are available separately. So we so if we take, for instance, knowledge and expertise, so uh, we can think about expert knowledge, for instance. We can think about expert networks that are popping up or market research that are developing and that giving access to that knowledge, to that expertise without going through a consulting firm first. And uh, sales and marketing is another example where uh, before, when you wanted from thought leadership, we wanted to think, find methodologies and tools. Um, and you had to go through a consulting firm because they were the only ones who have that. Now, every single consultant, us included, right, right, uh, uh, promote their work, promote their methodologies, promote their thought leadership. And so you have access to all this on, on, on the internet and it's, you don't have to hire a consultant to have access to that. And uh, same thing for the analytics and data crunching where you have many tools and you even have companies that do that. So uh, all of this is, is, you know, kind of making available some pieces of what was traditionally the consulting service, and that gives some opportunities for clients to just pick, you know, the part that they need uh, for for their for their company. Uh, what happened also is that uh, when companies, uh, when consulting firms started to optimize their own cost, their own SGNA cost, they realized that instead of having expensive consultants running some uh, research, they could uh, offshore some of the activities to India. And uh, they started uh, offshoring the activities to sometimes subsidiaries, sometimes uh, companies that were in, in, in India amongst other, other places, but mostly in India, and, uh, and to subcontract part of the research work that they were doing for clients, which was giving them a very efficient way to, uh, to get to the results. And then they were charging a premium when they were giving the, the results with a nice packaging and a nice PowerPoint presentation to the, uh, to the end clients. But what happened over time is that those companies that were doing the, uh, I would say the back office, uh, started to grow and to offer their services directly to clients. Which means that on some projects, I would not advise to do it for the largest projects and complex projects and so on, but for some specific projects, you can buy directly from the source. You don't need to buy from the consultant that is mostly putting a nice layer of uh, and a nice summary on an analysis that has been performed by, by somebody else. So they moved into the value chain to not only sell to consultant, but to sell directly to end clients. And this is, as a client, an opportunity because you can do that as well. Absolutely. So now that we have like explained, so there are many opportunities in consulting, in the different options within a consulting uh, project. So there's many, many moving pieces. How, what's the right way to approach that and make sure that you always have the best delivery model for your project? I think you so, have a poll, no? Don't you have a poll oh, before? Uh, mm, no? That was after I explained what are the different ones. Okay, so, you know, let me, let's leave it open. We, let's leave it open. We will, we will close it at the end. Okay. It's yeah, yeah. Open. Just, just feel free to answer the poll right now. Um, yeah. you can, you can answer the poll on what are the, 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 um, the resource that you use most often for your project. So it's not specifically, uh, consulting. It's project in general that have that expertise component. So the, mm -hmm. the, the idea here is really to uh, launch. Uh, let to, me, to, to, yeah, yeah let, let, me, let me comment on that one. Uh, in the same way that sometimes when you work on strategy, you need to clarify what you want to do and uh, what are the things that you're willing to do and the things that you definitely don't want to do in order to frame things. You frame the, the bounds in order to think better because you... Uh, for instance, uh, an example that uh, someone did that's kind of uh, uh, 
pretty versed in the art of reframing, says is that if I ask you to tell me three things that are white, it might be difficult. If I ask you to tell me three things that are white in your fridge, you will immediately identify that you have some milk, some cheese, some uh, so, some dairy, some other products. And uh, because you're thinking fridge, you frame your thinking better because it's a smaller playground. Here uh, is the same idea is to say, okay, internal consulting might be a good idea on some topics, but might not be a good idea on some others. What we have shown here is illustrative, but uh, it, having something like this in your own company to say internal consulting, they should focus on this and they, we should probably not use them on that. Uh, external market intelligence, it's good for general studies. It's good for prospective markets, but for end-to-end -end projects that require kind of a little more of, uh, of study or comparing things and bringing that into the context of the company, they might not be the, the, best, uh, the best partner. Micro consulting, Probably a good thing for small teams, but for large, uh, large transformative projects, you will not deliver that through a, through a marketplace. Expert networks, good idea if you have a very specific question. Probably not uh, a good idea if you want to do end-to-end -end projects. Questionable if you want to do competitive intelligence because you need to have a compliance officer in the room to make sure that you're not uh, you're not getting information you should not be getting. And uh, external consulting uh, here probably best suited for large projects. Uh, you could have also in the criteria the, the return on investment because you want times five or times 10 on, uh, on what you're investing in, uh, in external consulting. But uh, using external consulting for staff augmentation uh, might make sense if it's an offshore staff augmentation and you are in a Western country. Uh, might not make sense at all if you're doing a staff augmentation with a uh, uh, a consultant from a tier one firm that will be there three months with you at uh, $2,000 a day. So yeah. having this kind of framework uh, is something that is very, very useful in an organization. Most organizations do not have that, uh, but they may want to implement this as part of their, um, their toolkit. Absolutely. And, and just to, to look at uh, the, the poll, uh, what we see is that... Um, most of the other of the projects are led through with external consultant hybrid models and um, and a few through innovative but that's mostly external consultants so that that and that makes sense because that's what we see with our clients as well that you know large projects are most often external consultants and and uh, hybrid models and that makes sense based on what they can do so this is uh, this is not only relevant that that's probably a good idea uh so how organization by consulting so here we we're trying to show you that uh depending on how mature any uh, uh, organization is they will you know by consulting have different processes so what we call that these are the four levers that we have identify for companies from the less mature which is operational to the more mature that is best in class so that's very important to know that it's not not all companies should be in best in class right because when you are a startup for instance uh it, it, being best in class requires some you know processes and some structure that you may not need as a startup but uh, when you are a very large company, you don't want to be in the operational category. Okay, so this is this is one thing. So when you are a, a beginner in buying consulting, you just launch a project. You don't write an RFP. You absolutely not do a competition. Uh, you buy from consultants that you know most of the time, or friends of friends. And so this is the first level of 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 processes like I just launched my project and that's it. Companies that are a bit more mature go through an RFP. So um, going through an RFP doesn't necessarily mean that you are doing an RFP process per se, but at least you you put uh, you lay down the requirements that you want, and then you agree with the with the consultants of what you're looking for. And often you have a competition at least for large projects. So this is what standard companies do. Oh, then you arrive in the leading category. So the first one is, of course, you don't have two RFPs coming next year. Then one to one, you squeeze in some demand management. So most 
large companies have some sort of demand management implemented with uh, often a threshold where which for which other a certain threshold comes project are decided through a committee or they go through procurement and that gives some um you know decision making to to decide if it's worth launching that project earlier laurent was saying once you know if the project makes sense then you can decide how you want to deliver it you know demand management is is that first step does that project make sense do you, is it a, a high priority for us and and do i have the money to pay for it this is kind of the things that you need to ask yourself in demand management is it more important than others that i have that have lined up and you want to go from a uh the first come first serve basis or in some companies uh, as we say in french the ones who yells louder gets the best the project to an organized decision making where you decide as as a team what are the priorities and these are the projects that you want to launch so that's that's what leading companies do and then you have the best in class and the best in class they squeeze in between demand and rfp they will squeeze in an, another step that's defining the delivery model and so uh often actually the the demand and delivery model steps are very close because it it requires to think about the value at the same time as the limitation of the project and that's why doing that together or at least on the same step is often uh is often uh, done and because it can come together nicely so this is you know what we're talking about right now here today is that extra step in the best in class between demand and rfp where once I've decided that project makes sense, it, it's going to bring strategic value for my company uh, or it's going to allow us to launch later a strategic project or it is a regulatory project and we absolutely need to do it because if we don't, then we're going to lose value. Then how do we do that? How do we deliver? If, well, how do we do if I If I give a few examples from a, a project I've been recently facing, uh, one company was... Uh, was using consultants to do some uh, SAP testing. And uh, they, they were doing the SAP testing via one of the, the top, uh, I would say, the big four, uh, the big four companies. This activity was, uh, was outsourced uh, in, uh, in India. Uh, you had four people full time for one year to do the testing. Uh, the total cost of the project was uh, close to $1 million. I cannot disclose exactly all the elements, but the cost of four people in India to do SAP testing is about 100K. So you end up in a situation where you're using a consultant that is offshoring the work and taking a 90% margin on the project. Is it the right way and the right use of your money? Uh, is it kind of a more, uh, I would say, economical to, uh, to have a, a few people in-house or even to uh, uh, use an employer of record to get uh, a few guys that will do the testing in India and I can even, you can have them for 10 years with the cost of one project. And uh, that, that's one example. And another example could be that uh, you're running a, a transformation with some integration work and uh, you, you do this PMI uh, with uh, one of the MBB guys, McKinsey, BCG, Bain. Oliver Wyman for the, those that are familiar with this brand. And uh, you, uh, you decide that you want to get some support to capture the synergies. It's good. Why not? Uh, but you are short in resources, which is strange because you're merging two companies and firing a, a whole lot of people. But let's say you're short in resources and you start using this consultant for the project management uh, office, you know, the PMO. And uh, you end up uh, paying premium consultants at $3,000 a day for uh, putting together PowerPoint presentations and, uh, and having traffic lights on whether the projects are progressing or not. Is it the right delivery model? Maybe not. Definitely for the consultant, that's a very good model. But yeah, uh, for like the client, is that a good model? That's, uh, that's another question. So all those ideas about, okay, how do I deliver this? Do I need this? Yes. Okay. But once I've said that I want this, do I do this internally? Do I use an internal, an external expert? Do I use uh, consultants? Do I do it with an hybrid team? That's, uh, that's what we will be speaking in a few minutes, but that's, that's definitely a huge source of value. 
So, so in order to to uh, move from, you know, the the direct demand RFP process to to squeeze in some some delivery step in the middle, there, there are some prerequisites. And, and the first one is exactly what Laurent showed you before that table with these are the options that are available and this is how we want to use that in the company. So what are the options that we have and how do we want to use them? And, and that's kind of the first step. The, and that's very strategy oriented discussion on, you know, we want to work with um, with a um, expert networks, but these are the the really the, the you know the framework, the boundaries of how we want to use them and when. But then, when you have done that, that's where procurement is taking over, and to help qualify suppliers for each of those options. Because if you say, yeah, you can use consulting marketplaces, but then you let your your internal stakeholders just you know. Do what you want. Uh, there are so many of them. Expert networks are popping up everywhere. Uh, consulting marketplaces all over the place. Um, I think we saw, we see at the beginning, like seven or eight years ago, there was like two or three. And now I think that there are two more every year or five more every year. So there are many of them. And not all of them serve all industry or serve all regions or serve all capabilities. So you have to be very clear on which one really makes sense and which one you really want your teams to work with. And that's the idea on having a list of qualified suppliers. So they have kind of a, they, they have the, the freedom to choose what they want, but they have access to already tools that help them go do that in a control and, and risk as risk-free way even though we know that there's no zero risk that doesn't exist but you know the idea and then there's the last part which is a make or buy framework so we go back into again um in a procurement tool which is what are you know simple questions a simple process to help them decide if it makes sense to externalize or or not a project So, you know, of course, that's, that's the next step is like, but how do you do that extra, exactly? So we're not going to talk about value because value should be already taken into account in the demand management part. And as I said before, companies that start thinking about what delivery model is best has already thought about, should I make that project or not? They're already in that, in that mindset of value versus cost. So they're already there. The first, the first spot, and I know it's, it might look, you know, it is really taking a step back is that is my project a good candidate for external resources? And the idea here is that not all projects are successful when working with external consultants. And this is not always because external consultant didn't do a great job. When you decide what project you want to work with, with external consultants, you need to have four elements to those projects. The first thing is that you have to be able to define deliverable for this project, to really be clear on what do you expect as an outcome. The second part is, do you have a timeline that is clear for this project? It can't be, oh, maybe, you know, we want this ish. You have to be clear on what you want. Then there's the level of uncertainty. Uh, if we could, we could also call it as you know interdependency. Many projects, when they 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 um, they work, are using inputs from other part of the organization. And if you have a lot of interdependency and there's a lot of input that are expected from other projects or other activities that are working in parallel, then the level of uncertainty of your project is getting higher. And the problem is that your consultants. Even though you pay them for the results, you pay them for a given period. And if you have a very high level of uncertainty, then you end up with two things. First, potentially, at some point, the consultant will say, hey, that's it. I've done what was expected. You're not ready. That's on you. Let's start the project. And so you won't have your result, but you have to pay because they worked or they waited for you. And if they're idle, waiting for you, 
you're going to pay for them because you book their time, right? Even though they're committed to the result, but this is in to the extent that you're doing your part of the job. The second option is that they have your price that's going to be much higher because they will understand by talking with you, oh, you know what, they feel, I feel like they're not sure of what they want. I feel like there's a lot of uncertainty here. I feel like there's, um, there's a lot of things that will be moving pieces. You know what, let's take a 30%, you know, uh, safe net in order to to uh to be to be uh okay and so you're gonna pay higher cost you're gonna um have you know and all of this is not a good thing and the last part is do you have access to the necessary resources meaning is there in your in the market a company that can deliver what you're looking for and this this what makes a project a good candidate and if you don't and you say if you say no to one of those things, then then maybe you should consider another model, or maybe you should consider a hybrid model where you can just also pieces of your project that are clearly with clear boundaries, with a deadline, with a smaller level of uncertainty, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the first step. Is it is the project as it is right now a good candidate for external resources? And the next step is, what's the value that I will get by going external? Let's put it that way. <laughs> Let's put it that way. So the first thing is um, that skills related. So this is, so for those who are uh, familiar with, with procurement, this is a typical make or buy framework that we have adapted to consulting. So it's nothing breakthrough. It's not rocket science, but it's just plain um pragmatic framework the first thing is that do we need those do we need to develop those skills internally or not then is there a specific reason to go external we need to do something externally for a reason it, it can be many reasons that can be because we want to uh do differently we want to uh, uh uh implement a new methodology i'll give you an example we've worked recently with a company that is working in the um automotive aftermarket and what they wanted to do is take a methodology that is uh used in retail and then transpose it to their own market obviously this is something that is really hard to do with your internal resources because you don't have the knowledge you don't have the experience in retail and so working with external consultants was having access to people who did that in retail that could help them transpose that into uh after an uh, automotive aftermarket in the aftermarket so this is one example do we improve the business case if we accelerate the project that's a very important one as well usually when you work with external consultant as a team your project tends to go faster higher and i say tends to if that's not the case then maybe that's not the right option right the fourth one is extremely important can i supervise this project you cannot have consulting consultants coming in and then you just let them do their thing this is not how it works. You need to have people in your team that are able to manage the project, put in place the governance, make sure things are delivered on time and quality. If you don't have that, then that's a problem. And actually, this is outsourcing us open up, right? When you don't outsource activities that you don't, you can't control. So that's one thing. The thing other is like other companies that can provide that service. This is obvious. The last one is like super important is either sensitive ip or information involved in this project if that's a yes then you might think rethink working with external consultants right because is it worth it to bring in more people to the secret if 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 i do have a sensitive ip maybe i don't want it to um, to be uh, shared with a consultant. And we know that consultants have a Chinese walls, blah, blah, blah. Okay, fair enough. But the truth is that that's, we hire them for their expertise and their knowledge of what happens in the industry. 
So you have to think that even though they won't say it's company X, if they won't say what is happening, but it's there and they know it. So it's a risk that you're taking always. So how to decide? Once you have, you know, uh, seen that you have your externalization value, you see strategic value. So you see, as I mentioned before, demand management and and your uh, your um, make or buy framework that go together. This is how you decide. Okay, this is a project that has a strong impact if it's outsourced, and this one has a low impact when it's outsourced. So I'm not going to do it. Etc. So you can you can really uh, you can really decide which to which to to outsource and how you know which to do and how right. If it, sometimes you do it, but you do it in the house. Sometimes you do it, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, does that make sense? And this is a simple matrix that you have to build. So it's really easy to position that and to say, okay, I'm here. So this is the delivery model that I should use. So if we take <coughs> if we take an example, uh, and if we take a project that would be a significant restructuring of the of the company, and that is uh, extremely confidential and uh, quite touchy, and uh, you don't want issues with the unions and so on, uh, where would we be? Is there a strategic value? Definitely. Uh, is there an externalization value? Mm. The only externalization value I would see is that you, you don't do the cost cutting via, uh, via your internal resources. So they, they keep good relationships, but the externalization value could be also with the, with the speed of execution. Yeah. But, uh, it's, uh, it's not, it's not that obvious. And if you are looking at some very significant strategic moves, uh, do you want, you want to work with an expert as Ellen was saying, but if you work with an expert that is also working with everybody else in the market, do you really want him to know that what 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 are you, what are going to be your next moves? That's not uh, that's not obvious. I was working previously uh, on a strategic project sourcing for a chemical company. They wanted to work with somebody that had done already the same project for another consulting for another chemical company. The problem is that you end up with an expert of how to do a me too, but you don't differentiate. So is it exactly what you want to do? That's a, that's another question. Make sense? Do not hesitate if you have any questions. Huh? It's an interactive session. It's not a monologue from Elena or a, a duo from just Elena and myself. Okay. Let's start with last poll, maybe. Mm -hmm. So the, the last poll was about, you know, what's your biggest challenge when choosing a delivery model for a consulting project? Is it Identify, identifying the specific needs for this project? Is it balancing costs? Is it evaluating the skills and resources that you have uh, internally? Is it understanding, you know, the long-term impacts of, of each delivery model? And then how do you align the choice of delivery model with organizational strategy? So I think actually the last one should be done if you have a, a framework, as we said. And, and uh, 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 I think there is one answer that is missing, which is yeah. uh, we don't see, we don't even think about it this way. <laughs> well, I wouldn't. <went> th <laughs> if if I look at what I would have answered, you know, in my time with uh, with Solvay, I think we are not thinking about it this way. Yeah. Because either we take a consultant or we don't, but that's it. Yeah, it's true that that's not always uh, something obvious to to understand. Um, you know, in, 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 and as I mentioned at the beginning, the difficulty is that it's not only about strategy. It's about strategy. It's about cost. It's about relationship. It's about acceptance and resistance of stakeholders. All of these come together, and this is what what makes it a bit harder to decide what is the right option. And, and, you know, from, from the answers that we have here, we see that, you know, balancing the cost and the quality is something. And um, I think that th there is a, some, sometimes a misunderstanding, a feeling that when you don't work with the big names and you don't work with a company that does it all for you, 
then you won't have great results. That's not always true. Uh, quality is not always uh, related to the price tag. And, and it's important, but it's important to know um, what, what model you can use in what situation where you can really, really bring value. And, and I think this is, the, I think the, it's really relevant, you know, most of the time it's how do you balance the cost with the quality of the service? And, and that's a fair question. Uh, so let's go to practical examples. So we're trying, we try to compile, to compile a, a, a tiny list of examples to show you that actually there are many different options here that are available uh, and, and, and different ways to, to, to uh, tackle that delivery models and that they, all of them can be used um, by the same companies depending on who they are, the different groups even in the same company. So let's get started. So the first, uh, the first one is internal consulting. So this is classic. We have an internal consulting group. And uh, we have, as Laurent mentioned, it can be a division, it can be uh, uh, several groups that work on, on different projects. And this is a classic, um, this is a classic uh, case of, you know, um, delivery model. But the question is that who are the companies that really have those cons internal consulting groups? And this, the first thing is that it's obviously companies that have recurring consulting needs. And that's why we often see those consulting groups that are born on operational excellence topics. Because most companies in manufacturing, for instance, they have those issues and they do those projects every year or every two years. And so it makes sense. And they do that like all the time in the different parts of the world and different factories. So that makes a lot of sense to have an internal group handling that. Um, another type of companies that we see having that are those that also have that a strong continuous improvement culture. So they have in place already processes and, you know, they have excellence group and they, they, they think about, you know, um, how to improve their ways of working, improve their processes. And so they have teams that are dedicated to working with the different groups in order to always get the best practices. So that makes a lot of sense. You want to add something, Laurent? Nope. Okay. So the, the next well, we, we is... could we could provide we could provide some examples. Yes. Uh, what I was no mentioning earlier is that internal consulting groups can be uh, can can have different names, and uh, sometimes they are called as internal consulting groups. Sometimes they are uh, they are known as uh, excellence teams. We uh, we used to have a manufacturing. Excellence group, uh, marketing excellence group, uh, strategy, uh, not strategy excellence. We had a sales uh, excellence, uh, supply chain excellence. At the end of the day, what is it? It's people that are not in the day-to-day -day activities and uh, that are working on improving capabilities, improving processes. Sometimes they are in the quality group as well. Uh, you had good lean groups that were doing this also uh, when lean was uh, was a fancy uh, was a fancy word. And uh, you have examples in most uh, industrial companies tend to have an internal consulting group. Then sometimes the industrial consulting group is a career accelerator. Sometimes it's the area where people go to die, <laughs> like the elephant, yeah. you know, and yeah, it's very yeah. difficult to come back from it. Um, it it's usually uh, seen as a, as a good sign. Um, when you have recurring consulting needs, it's definitely uh, a massive source of... Uh, at the same time, savings, but also uh, improvement of your capabilities, improvement of the knowledge uh, of uh, of your teams. Uh, they should not become, kind of say, permanent internal consultants. But spending a couple of years and then moving back to another job uh, is something that's definitely pretty uh, pretty nice. Uh, I was uh, discussing a few weeks ago with uh, someone from uh, one of the largest retail banks in Europe, and was telling me that they have divided by by four their uh, their utilization of external consulting and that the, the first thing is that they didn't feel the pain so that was the first realization say okay we did that we divided by four we didn't feel the pain but they have also created an internal consulting group and they, they have it's mandatory to check before starting any project if it could be done uh, leveraging the uh, the internal consulting group that's it i let you move to the next page i see we have <laughs> 
four minutes left. Yeah, yeah, I will for a few minutes. So the second one is a hybrid model. So we 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 said that before. A hybrid model is mixing, um, you know, internal resources with all external resources. So. Uh, what examples, what type of project can be done with that? We mentioned before the PMI project where you have um, some of the activities that are organization design or that are strategy, you know, in order to prepare for or see some part of the synergy capture that requires some complex, you know, um, redefining, redefining, redefinition of the ways of working and so on. This re might require external consulting, but, but, PMO typically is something that can be done at in house, or you could imagine a system where you hire a consulting firm to define the PMO ways. You know, this is how we will do the PMO, but then all the PMO people are internal uh, people. So that's a way um, to 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 do it. Uh, another one is project uh, that require um, that require um, you know, a strong internal expertise. Uh, I'll give you an example. We we worked a couple of years ago with a high tech company, and they they have a very strong expertise on uh, in their domain, and it's not necessarily available outside of the company. And so the way they work with consultants is that they they build teams, they build a sort of a virtual plateau where you have the consultants that bring the methodology. It was a strategic a strategy project. The, the, the consultants brought the, the, the methodologies and, and the, you know, the way to, to explore things and, and the, the, the powerhouse, the power fire to really uh, crush the numbers and make sense of all the data. But the company brought their experts there so they could exchange with the consultants and really guide them through the specificities of their industry. And here, the hybrid team makes a lot of sense, right? And then there's a project where you want some knowledge transfer. You have a team that you want to professionalize and you have that project that needs to be done. And you say, you know what, I'm going to do both. I'm going to hire consultants that I will require to transfer knowledge as part of the RFP. I will ask them to teach and coach my teams in order to get them um, improve their skills and then I will I will make sure that uh, that my project is done. You do two, you know, you kill uh, two birds with one stone. In that case, you need them to work closely with your teams because you want your teams to do some of the work themselves so they can, you know, learn things. Okay, so uh, Manuel was asking, how how does the typical ROI for internal consulting versus hybrid models look like in terms of cost and time? So that's a very good question, but it's really hard to answer uh, <laughs> because the ROI depends on two things. On one side, you have the, the cost. Obviously, when you work with internal teams, you tend to, and I said tend to because that depends on the type of project, but you tend to have costs that are lower because uh, you have salaries that are based on your company cost and you're a big company. If you work with a very small consulting firm, you may be uh, quite close in terms of cost, but nonetheless, internal teams tend to be less expensive than external consultants. Where the difference is, is in the value, because there are it's value over cost, right? And um, that's where uh, you might have a, a, have a, a difference. Not saying that internal consultants don't deliver. I'm not saying that, but it's also because you don't use them on the same project. But let's say that it's easier for certain project, it's easier as an external consultant to deliver and to make sure you deliver and to kind of shake a little bit things and, and make people to adhere to something while it's more difficult internally because you're still part of the company and you still have a future in the company. So. What I would say is that internal project will have impact, the cost will be lower, while when you work with hybrid teams, the cost of the total project might be higher, but you might end up with a project that are, le that are shorter because you have more people that are more um, used to do projects like this. So you can have a project that is shorter and you can have a project that delivers 
uh, a bit more because you have a different expertise. So that the uh, end, take, yeah. If you, if you take uh, just the cost, just the cost yeah. dimension, uh, I would say it's a minimum of factor two. Yeah. In, in the in the cost, the cost of someone. Let's take a let's take a, a junior a resource <coughs> in um, would be around. Uh, let's put it in the US. Uh, around sixty to seventy thousand uh, dollars, with uh, all the, the uh, additional cost, maybe a hundred. Uh, the charge uh, at from a consulting firm will probably be uh, two thousand a day times uh, uh, one hundred and fifty days to two hundred days. If I make it on a comparable basis on a, on a full year, uh, we are looking at uh, one hundred versus four hundred. So it's a times four. Uh, if you're looking at more senior resources, then the gap is not that uh, important. Depends if you are with the top consulting firms, they tend to charge uh, senior people at a much higher cost. But uh, it's not uh, the, the premium is not that big with smaller consulting firms. So the, the full cost on a full year would might be, uh, let's say, uh, uh, 2,500 times 200 days. So that's 500. And uh, the cost of a senior guy in a company would be around 300 to 400. So you have a between a factor two with the senior guys and a factor mm -hmm. four with the, the junior ones. Um, then the hybrid has to mesh. Uh, you need to have yeah. a good synergy between the two and it should not be, uh, the, I would say, the, the, the consulting firm considering that the, the, the internal resources have been imposed and they are just a burden you need to live with. And, and then in that case, you double the cost because you are putting guys that have nothing to do and you're paying the consulting firm anyway. Uh, to, to, to deliver the work. But uh, I don't know if it answers your, your question, uh, Manuel, but uh, I would say from a pure cost standpoint, yeah, we are we are looking at a factor two to four. Okay. Um, then there is unbundling. So that's that's what we mentioned before is that you use you use only pieces of what was traditionally a um, a consulting service and you use only the pieces that you need and an example a very good example it's a company that i've worked uh, I've, uh, uh, we worked with in the past that where they, they they had former strategy consultants within their strategy group and meaning that when they were launching the project they didn't need the methodology they didn't need the whole you know uh project management thing they only needed them on very specific part that are more expertise related so not only were they working with uh, only small project with consultants, but they were able to work with boutiques because usually boutiques tend to have a better depth of expertise on, on a given project. So they, they could decrease their cost. You know, if we discuss about cost and, and um, you know, the, the ROI, they were really getting maximum value for minimum cost because they were just keeping them exactly on what they need and everything else they did, they did that themselves. Uh, strategy boutiques do that. Um, they, they tend to uh, externalize sometimes some part of the project to uh, subject matter experts. That's exactly what it's about. They go and look for an expert, either as an independent or, or through an expert uh, interview. This is typically something that is very, well, can, can be well, very, very useful. When I was running the strategy group for a chemical company, I was buying uh, a package of 20 interviews per year from um, what was their name glg yeah and uh and then we, this was enough for us because for the, the key topics we wanted to investigate uh, innovation mna we were using two three four interviews um you don't have kind of a project like that every day so six six times three or six times four and it was uh, about what we were uh, what we were consuming on a yearly basis but uh, it was much better than buying a consulting study at, uh, at 50 grand uh, to 100K uh, each time I wanted to investigate a given topic. I just had to run four interviews at uh, $1,000 or $2,000 a piece. And, uh, and that was it. I had my answer. Absolutely. And the last part is staff augmentation. So that's a classic. But before, you would do that through a consultant. And now there are some businesses that either you do to a consulting marketplace to hire freelancers or you have some some companies now uh you know specialize in in workforce that offering some some um flexible solutions and very high high level profile so this is also another way to go around that working with a consulting firm 
uh, where you will have overheads and all of this. So th that's also a way to, to you know, to do, um, to do hybrid work. So that was it. Uh, I think we'll stop here. Uh, if there are any other questions, um, please don't hesitate to, uh, to, to ask them. Uh, now we are, we passed six minutes to, to, to the webinar. If you have other questions, uh, either ask them now, or you can send us an email, um, and ask your yep. question directly. Yes. Let's do that. And, and just that, you know, very quickly, uh, if you're interested in benchmarking, we, 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 we are launching the our benchmark. It's starting to be nicely. The email that you see, uh, that you see at the bottom, hel at consultingquest.com is the one where you can drop your questions. You can, if you're interested in the, in the, um, in the benchmark of, if you have a question that we didn't answer, just drop it there and we will, we'll answer that, uh, as quickly as possible. And that's it. Just that, you know, thank you. Uh, thank you again. Uh, our next webinar is in March, uh, March 18th. It will be about negotiations uh, and using pricing benchmarks to negotiate. So I think that's going to be an interesting one as well. And so don't hesitate. Um, if you uh, if you're curious about it, we'll we'll uh, we don't have yet put that on our website, so you won't find it yet. But it should be done in the week. And don't hesitate to to register early on. Uh, and um, and then uh, we'll contact you. you. We'll contact you anyway. Yeah, of course. You'll say you'll you'll receive an email anyway. Thank you to everyone. I uh, hope you have a very great uh, end of your day, and uh, and I hope to see you our next uh, webinar uh, in two months. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.